Samuel got up and he went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli, he realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to him, Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls you again, say this. Say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And then in verse 10, it said, And the Lord came and called as before, fourth time. And he said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak. Your servant is listening. And at that moment, God spoke into Samuel. Chapter 3, it said, The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and give messages to Samuel at the tabernacle. Samuel was young and he had never heard God's whispers before. He didn't even know what to do with them. And, and he, <coughs> Eli, the, the, the priest, he had had many encounters with God and he had heard God on many occasions, so he was familiar with God's voice. Therefore, he instructed Samuel, he said, Samuel, when you sense God's whisper again, he said, you just simply respond with, speak, Lord, I'm listening. He didn't tell him, he didn't say, go, you know, go have a prayer meeting, go, go uh, start singing worship songs. He didn't say, go you know, tell everybody that, hey, God is speaking to me. He didn't tell him anything. He said, you just speak and say, God, I'm listening. When we invite God to speak into our life and then we listen to God, he speaks. He will actually speak to you and to me. He may do it through his word. He may do it through someone else. He may do it through a song. He may <clears throat> do it through na <clears throat> nature. Excuse me. He may even do it through a child. But he will speak to us. His whispers, they come uh, through the spoken word. They come through impressions. They come through nudgings of the Holy Spirit. They even come through our pain. The bottom line is he's waiting for an invitation and a listening ear. And if we'll get quiet, and we'll get still, and we'll listen, God will speak to us. And here's the thing, God doesn't want to complicate this. I've heard people, I grew up in church, and I've heard people over the years make it sound so mystical, and whoo, you know, God's going to speak, and there's going to be angel feathers coming down. I mean, it's, you know, they just really make it this hard, mystical deal. But it's not hard, it's not a mystery. God says, I'll speak. If you'll listen, I'll speak. And if you'll respond, I'll speak to you. And he wants to speak words of instruction and words of encouragement. And he wants to speak words of correction. And he wants to give words of guidance to us. In fact, a, a scripture in Isaiah, I love this. He said, your ears will hear him right behind you. A voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or whether to the left. What is he saying here? He say, wouldn't it be great if we could go through every day of our life and through every moment of our life and have a, an inner voice that guides us and says, hey, you shouldn't do this. Or, hey, you should make this choice. Hey, you need to call this person. Or, hey, you need to go here or go there. And he said, that's the way it's supposed to operate. If we will listen, God will speak and he will instruct us. And he'll do it 24-7. The question is not will God speak to us and direct us. The question is are we listening? Multiple ways that he speaks. So why is it so important that we recognize his voice and we follow these promptings, follow these whispers? Why is it so important we obey his instruction? I'm going to give you three things real quick. One, it leads to fulfillment. The one who designed us, created us. The one who knows our, our weaknesses, our strength, knows us inside and out. He's saying, I'm the one that's going to guide you. And I will bring fulfillment if you'll follow my purpose, follow my plan for your life. One of my favorite verses in Joshua 1.8, he said, study the book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and will you be successful. He wants us to fulfill the purpose for which he created us. And he said, I'll be the voice that guides you and directs you in how to do that. Second reason is, he instructs us one step at a time. One step at a time. Rarely does God ever reveal the whole picture or the whole map. Very rarely does God show you the beginning and the end. And I think there's several reasons for that. One is because maybe he doesn't want us to get ahead of him. 
Because if we knew the whole deal, we'd be jumping ahead. Of, we'd be going out there trying to, to make things happen. Anybody here, uh, I know I'm probably the only one, but anybody here, you watch a TV show or you watch a movie and your wheels are already spinning and you're trying to get to the end of the show, I mean, in your head, you're like, okay, this guy, you know, Colonel Mustard did it in the den with a candlestick or whatever. And you're just trying to put the pieces together and jump ahead of the storyline. I may be the only one in the room like that. But I like to jump ahead. I like, you know, it starts and I'm already figuring out how it's going to end. Maybe that's why God doesn't give us the whole plan at one time. He's saying, hey, I'm going to give you a beginning and trust me, okay? Just trust me. I'm not going to reveal the whole plan or the whole purpose to it. Another reason is, is maybe because it keeps us in constant contact with him. When he reveals one step at a time, then we have to be in constant contact with God. You have a GPS and it'll tell you where to turn. It'll say, you know, you're going to turn in 100 feet or, or 500 feet. You're going to make a left. And very rarely does it say, okay, now, if you make that left, you're going to go down here and take another right, and you're going to find the store. You're going to turn left there and then the desk. No, it's going to tell you turn by turn how to get to where you're wanting to go. And that's the way God operates. He will instruct us. He'll speak. He'll whisper to us as we're going through life. And another reason is probably because he knows only one step is all we can handle at one time. You know, if I knew ahead of time what my journey would, would hold for me, if I knew ahead of time all the, the ups and the downs and the tragedies and the, the triumphs and all these things, if I knew ahead of time what my life held for me, sometimes we wouldn't even start the journey, would we? If we knew, okay, over that next hill, it's going to be really bad. But then there will be a good spell and a good season. If we knew what was ahead, sometimes we wouldn't even start. Maybe that's why God doesn't show us an entire year on January 1st. Maybe that's why God doesn't on January 1, he said, okay, now here's what your life's going to look like this year. And here's all you're going to go through and here's where you're going to end up. No, what does he do? He breaks the year down into months. He breaks the months down into weeks. He breaks weeks into days. He breaks days into hours and hours into minutes. And he's saying, here's the next step. Here's the next minute of your life. Here's the next hour of your life. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And probably the reason he doesn't reveal but one step at a time to us is because oftentimes we won't, he won't give us the next step until we take the step that he's asked us to take. He won't show us what he wants us to what the next step is supposed to be until we actually do what he's already asked us to do. I heard a guy say one time, it's a lot easier to steer a moving car than it is a car that's parked. Some interesting story, Abraham from the Old Testament. God told him, imagine this, God told him, he said, Abraham, I want you to pack up your family, pack up the U-Haul, get everything that you want, put it in the truck, and I want you to head out on the interstate. And Abraham's going, okay, great, where are we going? And God's saying, hey, I'll let you know when you get there. Imagine that. He told Abraham, he said, you just pack up and you start heading out because I'm going to lead you to a place, a new land, a, a great land of your own. I'm going to lead you there, but I'm not telling you where it's at. I'm not going to show you the end result. You, I'm just, just follow me. Just follow me as I tell you what step to take and you take the next step. God was whispering to Abraham. He said, just take the next step. And Abraham's like, well, where is this going? And he said, you'll know when you get there. Just take the next step. Jesus called 12 followers. What did he say? He didn't say, hey guys, I want you to sign up because eventually here's where you're going to be and here's what you'll do. And no, he just went to him and he said, hey, follow me. Just take the next step. Just, just follow me. Just follow me. I'm going to take you somewhere, but I just want you to follow me. And the hard part about hearing God's whisper and obeying God's whisper is it involves a word that we don't like usually, and that's the word trust. We have to trust. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice. Listen for God's voice, his whispers, his nudgings, his prompting. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go, and he's the one who will keep you on track. When I trust and believe in the trustworthiness and the goodness of God in his plan for my life, then I can confidently obey the whisper and take the next step that he's asking me to take. 
And the reason perhaps that you're not hearing God give you another step to take is, is it maybe because we haven't taken the step he's already asked us to take. God never reveals more until we've obeyed what he's already revealed. And then the last one is this. When we heed the whisper of God and, and we follow that whisper, it allows God to use us in powerful and in extraordinary ways. I thought as I was getting ready for this message, I thought about this church and, and uh, this is our 15th year. And I thought how this church all began with a little nudging, a little whisper in my heart, in my soul. It was on a plane 19 years ago on a plane from Chicago flying back to Atlanta. And it was a whisper, it was a nudging, it was something I know this is what I'm supposed to do. And I didn't know where it would end up, I didn't know what it would look like, I just knew I had to take the next step. And as I took that step, God has always been faithful, always been faithful to work in powerful and extraordinary ways. You're going to hear about another extraordinary story. Kayla, come up here and join me. This is... Uh, this. It, this was a God thing, the way this really got set up. But uh, Kayla Mullis, this is Travis and Becky's daughter, and uh, she has an older brother that she claims, Trey, and uh, <laughs> grandparents are here. But I, I've known Kayla since the day she was born. So I've, I've watched her grow, and I've watched what God has done, and, and really these last few years have been amazing to watch what God has done in, in Kayla's life. But Kayla just recently took a trip, and uh, she went to Ecuador, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about that for just a second, but uh, sh she's in nursing school. She's, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to uh, Children's Hospital? Yes, Children's of Alabama. I'll be in the Pediatric Emergency Department. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And uh, Kayla heard a whisper or a nudge from God about the, a trip that she needed to take, and I'm going to ask her to, to tell us about it. Tell us about what led to this trip to Ecuador. Okay. Um, so early on, I would say God definitely instilled a passion for nursing into my life. I've wanted to be a nurse for, I guess, since about freshman year of high school. Um, and I heard about the trip when I got into Auburn's nursing program, and I knew it might be something I want to do. Um, because the more my relationship has grown with God, the more I've seen um, the purpose for my life and the purpose for all of our lives is um, to tell people about him and to love on people and so I thought this was a great opportunity to do that um, I actually had this opportunity and another opportunity with my church in Auburn to go to Ghana um, and what was cool about that is in Ghana I would have been able to see a child that I sponsored but in Ecuador I would be able to um, practice my nursing abilities and get experience there as well um, and through fervent prayer for about a week, God made it really clear um, through those small whispers and through that gut feeling that I could do more of his work in Ecuador. Um, so that's how I ended up going. And through his provision, I fundraised the money through so many people, especially in this church, who helped me get there. Awesome. Awesome. How, now, how long did you go and stay down there? We were there for nine days, um, and we set up a clinic <laughs> in a little village called Kutaglawa. It's kind of hard to pronounce. But I'll let her say that. I couldn't. She <laughs> told me I couldn't pronounce it. Yeah, so it's in South Quito, Ecuador. Um, it's about 20,000 people, and we were the first medical team to be there in over 26 years. Um, and we saw about 400 patients. And these people, I mean, they literally had nothing. They were living in shacks on the sides of the roads. And um, like I said, they hadn't seen medical help in t over 26 years. Now, now, you told me a story about mm -hmm. uh, the lady on the crutch here. Mm -hmm. T tell us about that, a little bit about her. Okay, so her name is Fanny. As you can see, she has one leg. Um, she's a single mother of two children. And every day she hikes up a one mile high, uh, hill to go at the side of the bus stop and sell water bottles. That's her living. That's how she makes a living. Um, on a good weekend, she would bring home $20 to live off uh, for the next week for her and her kids. I think while we were there that weekend, she had made $3. Um, and that's just, 
heartbreaking because, I mean, you see this woman who's so dedicated to her children, you would think, man, she must be sad, she must be depressed. No, this woman is full of life and she is determined and she's actually the reason why we got set up in that village. She sought out medical help for the people in her village. She saw a need and she um, took it upon herself to get some help. That's, that's pretty incredible I, you, when you told me that she was the reason mm -hmm. that you guys went there. Yes, and, uh, so you, you were telling me a little bit about this one earlier, the, yeah. just the living conditions. Mm -hmm. So, so th I think you can see on the corner there, there's a little shack. Um, that's pretty much what everybody lives in in this particular village. Um, it's just miles and miles of dirt roads, of shacks, of, um, I mean, clothes hanging out on the lawn. You know, you're lucky if you have a cow or a goat to help you. Um, but, yeah, the living conditions are heartbreaking. But, like I said, these, uh, these people don't let that steal their joy. Tell, tell us about, and you mentioned this in the office earlier, about the glasses. Oh, yeah. Um, um, so we saw, I think she was around 85, this woman came in um, to our clinic, and she couldn't see. She had terrible vision, and we were able to give her a pair of glasses. And as soon as she put on the glasses, she just started crying, I mean, pouring tears. Um, and that was so moving because she was so grateful just for a pair of glasses. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I want to ask you this. What was the biggest takeaway that you had from this trip? I mean, you, you said you heard a whisper, you heard a nudge, felt mm -hmm. that nudge, felt like this was the trip that you needed to go on yeah. and that you can make the biggest difference doing this. And what, so what was, your, what was your takeaway from all this? What did that? Yeah. Did so um, the biggest thing that I took away from these people were like, they literally had nothing, but they were so full of life and they were so content in um, everything they did and they didn't look at their circumstances and ask for pity or sympathy. They just wanted to get to know you. They just wanted to love on other people and spread the light of Jesus and um, you know that's because their fulfillment only came from Jesus. And so it was hard to come back to the United States where I see so many people in my life that I love and myself included to where we settle for less of the life that Jesus died for us to live. And I think that's because we reach for fulfillment in all these other things, in material possessions, in, um, you know, social ladder of popularity and that kind of thing. Um, so it was really hard to see the people I love settling for less, like I said, myself included, um, choosing to sit on the sidelines instead of spreading the joy of Christ and loving on people um, the way that these people do. So it just shows that fulfillment can only come from Jesus. And I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize that I didn't live the, God, the life that Jesus died for me to live. And we say it all the time in my church in Auburn um, that we don't want to stop when it's short of the life that Jesus died for us to live. And so that's my big takeaway, I think. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Any regrets? Absolutely not. I'm already making plans <laughs> to go back next year. If awesome. anyone would like to donate to the cause, <laughs> that'd be great. But you'll have a bucket at the back door today. Uh, tell them real quick about this girl. You told me about her. But. Yeah, her name is Samira. Um, I met her the first day. The kids there were absolutely incredible. You say hola to them, and the next thing you know, they're on top of you and hugging and loving on you. Um, but her name's Samira, and... After the first day, she cried when we left, and every consecutive day after that, she would greet us off the bus and give each one of us the biggest hug, um, and it was just really hard to leave her and her family. Um, you know, I was only there for four days, but the connections I made were absolutely incredible, um, and like I said, I can't wait to go back. So would you just say it was life-changing? Oh, absolutely. Definitely no regrets. So if you hear another whisper, or you call in? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Kayla, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank sharing. you. We thank appreciate you. it very much. <laughs>
and the excitement in her as she shared the story of what God had, had done in Ecuador and what he was doing in her life. And it all started, it started with just a nudge or a whisper. And she basically said what Samuel did. I guess it was basically, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And when I think about this, I think, and, and this really is kind of the question I want to leave you with today, what might God be whispering to you? Now, it may not be to go to Ecuador or some other part of the world, but maybe there's something already that God is speaking to you. You already know there's something you should be doing. You, there's a nudge there. There's an impression. What might God be whispering to you to do? Some of you whispering God, uh, sensing God whispering to you even today, even through this series we've been in it. And he's been whispering, nudging. You feel like, oh, there's something I need to do. I know this is something I'm supposed to do. I know God has drawn me to do this. And he's simply waiting for us to say, speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. It may be a decision that you need to make. It may be a step that you need to take in your life. Maybe something God is whispering to you about your family or your children or school or work or personal life or your finances or an area that he's leading you to serve in the church or serve in the community. For some, it could be as simple as just a, an invite. Maybe he's put somebody on your mind. We, we talked last week about inviting someone to the Easter service because that's when people are most prone and open to accepting an invitation to church. And it could be a life-changing invitation for them. And maybe God's already been dealing with you and whispering someone's name in your life and, and, and somebody you know you need to contact, somebody you know you need to, to go see. And it's not by accident that God's doing that. That God, usually when God whispers someone's name to you, he's already dealing with them. And he's just waiting for someone to say, okay, Lord, I'm speak, I'm listening, I'll obey, I'll follow. For some of you, he's whispering, and, and perhaps he's whispering about your relationship with him. He wants all of us. He wants to be number one in our life. We sense that, we know that deep down inside when God is speaking to us, we, we feel a tug at our heart. We know that He wants us, to be, and it wants us to be in a deeper relationship with Him, a stronger relationship with Him. And that's God whispering to us. That's Him whispering in our life, saying, I love you, I care about you, you're important to me, you're valuable to me. I want us to be in a relationship together. So whatever God's whispering and nudging you about, here's the important thing, and we did this last week, in Hebrews 3.15, he said, today if you hear God speaking, you hear his voice speaking to him, don't harden your heart. Don't resist it. Don't put it off. Heed the voice. Heed what God is speaking into your life, what he wants to do in you and through you. You sense God leading you and nudging you to make a change. What, what are those changes? And, and take a step in obedience and say, God, okay, I'm listening. Your servant's listening. I'll obey you. We have to be in a relationship with him. That's the key. And I, I love something that Kayla said earlier. She said the, the more she got to know God, that she that began, began to be a little clearer what God was wanting her to do and the kind of life he was wanting her to live. When you hear God's whisper, obey them. Obey them and it'll forever change us. God loves us so much and he has so much he wants to say to us. He has the answers that we're seeking he has the direction that we need for our life. He loves us so much and he's whispering and he's saying, lean in close to me. And then as Samuel said, as we lean in, we say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And then we trust him. We trust him to take the next step, whatever God's asking us to do. And then we can see God work in and through us in extraordinarily powerful ways. We're about to partake of communion and it, it's it's ready and down front and i'm going to pray and they're going to lead us in a song and as we're singing i'm going to invite you to come and just uh partake of the elements carry them back to your seat you can uh, partake of them as you are ready to as we sing this this final song together but as we get ready to partake of this i thought what a reminder of the depth of christ's love for each of us to remember the link that he went to in order to have a relationship with us, in order that we could be on a level that we could speak together and we could communicate together what he endured in order that we might have a relationship with him 
that we might know him and we might recognize his voice. So as we prepare our hearts this morning to partake of communion of this sacred moment, listen for his voice today. Listen for his nudging and his promptings today in our life and open our heart. And as we do, we say, Lord, speak. Your servant, your servant is listening.